I'm Frances McCarthy and you'll be joining us for Star Stuff here at Black Rock Castle Observatory. I'll be talking about the moon, about the phases that we see, its appearance in the sky, what causes an eclipse, and how did we get to the moon? What did we find when we got there and what are the plans to go back to the moon? So to the meat of our talk about the moon and we're going to look at a little bit of background information, we're going to look at the kind of things that you might need to cover. Everybody loves these, don't they? This is where I figured we could easily identify the moon as being the topic in junior cycle science. So our, our catch-all everything, definitely. Comparing planets and moons, we'll have a look at that because there's some really interesting things that come out when you do that, moon and Earth that gives us information about the moon and about the Earth and about the differences between them. The model is probably the most straightforward in a teaching approach because there is a model that works, there's some unexpected things that come out of it, but that's where I think teachers will be most confident. And then there is a way to go future roles and space exploration given that the moon is the only place where humans got out of the spaceship and walked around that wasn't floating in space 400 kilometers up. So going to what moon exploration means and what is being planned, and there are plans. So I think with anything about the moon, you start with what you can see. So this is a montage. This appeared originally in Astronomy Picture of the Day. If you're not familiar with that website, APOD, A-P-O-D, it's wonderful. Different astronomical image every day. It's been running since the 1990s. So if you don't find one that you're interested in, go back a couple of days. But just popping it up on the whiteboard, what is this? What do you think of it? How do you feel about it? A discussion, even two, three minutes, of a different astronomical image. And you don't have to hunt for them because it's got one for you. It comes, all the APODs come with a little blurb written at the bottom with links to more information. So if you treat it as a trigger of an inspiration or a something, if you want to find out the science, you've got something to help you find the science. So this is of one lunation. This was from January 2018. So we have our very skinny little crescent. So we start top left run through, we have a full moon in the center, and January 2018 when these were taken, there was a lunar eclipse on that day, so we have that beautiful ready eclipsed moon continuing through until we have a sliver at the end. All right? So we're looking five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, 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 We don't have the new moon phases, which is the ones before this and after that when they link around because they're very tricky to catch with a camera because when you're looking at the very, very skinny little crescent moon, you're looking towards the sun and you're going to wreck your camera. So we just have 25 days of this lunation, uh, not every single day because these were taken by an observer looking up at the sky. If you try to take these pictures with your phone, you tend to get a little disappointed, all right? Because remember, your phone is responding to light and the moon is honkingly quite bright. So all you get is a blob. If you want to be taking these photos, you need to go very short exposure, very quick pictures, okay? You need someone who knows your cameras better than I do. Any picture I've tried to take of the moon has not looked like that, okay? So, better cameras, better skill with a camera, you'll be able to capture these pictures. But these are very easy to observe in the sky. All you need is the weather to cooperate a little bit. So I understand that you might set this for a year. Can you see, can you spot each of these phases of the moon over the course of a year? And you'll have somebody running in going, I got one! I saw the full moon. They actually saw the full moon. So that's the observable features. You can see this just looking up in the sky. Why you see it, well, this is the type of image you get. All right? 
So we reference the ecliptic plane. So the Earth is going around the Sun in a big circle. That circle, if you stretched it out and put a little board on it, we call the plane of the ecliptic. The Moon is also orbiting us. It does not line up exactly with the ecliptic. So the Moon is at a little bit of a tilt, roughly 5 degrees. 5 degrees is very, very little. But it is sufficient to explain why we don't get eclipses every month. So eclipses refer to the ecliptic. Notice the names are the same. So you get an eclipse when the moon is in the orbital, moon's orbital plane is in the ecliptic plane. Okay? So your eclipses are only going to happen a couple of times a year. Because that moon's orbital plane keeps its tilt as the Earth and Moon move around the Sun. So if we're tilted here, over this side, we're tilted here. Over in the front, we'll still be tilted to that same angle. Over to the back, we'll be tilted at that same angle. Okay? So we keep that ecliptic plane, orbital plane, tilted with respect to the stars. So that means when you get your eclipse, and everybody gets excited about an eclipse, all right? Solar eclipse, the moon blocks us out from the sun. Some of those are spectacular, all right? Uh, there is one this summer, but that's in Chile. So unless you're my boss and got invited, because we're the European Southern Observatory rep in Ireland, to go to Chile, it's a trip to the Southern Hemisphere to see the eclipse this summer. Uh, there was a spectacular eclipse across the United States in 2017, August 21st, 2017. That went from the West Coast across to the East Coast, was one of the best eclipses in recent years, in that it was over a large landmass and reasonably easy to transport yourself around. My uncle went to it, one of the, the, the uh, young explainers who works here at the castle went to it. They're still raving about it. Uh, there's another US-based eclipse coming up in a few years' time. I'm thinking about it, but it's an April eclipse. It goes from Mexico up over Canada. Canada in April can be a bit snowy. So I'm debating about it. Even though I'm Canadian, I know what that Canadian April is like. And you'll come across these kind of images showing how a lunar eclipse happens. Now they go into the main points of the shadow, but don't catch why you don't get them every month. Okay, so we're happy with the shadows. The idea that the sun shines on the earth, and the moon can go in the shadow of the earth. Similarly, the moon can be on the side where the sun is, and make a shadow back on the earth. So it's straightforward shadows, and what is being blocked is the type of eclipse. Solar eclipse, the sun's being blocked, lunar eclipse, the moon is being blocked. But why you don't get them every month is just due to that tilt of the moon's orbit. So to get the eclipse, the moon at full moon for a lunar eclipse, or new moon for a solar eclipse, has to be in the plane of the Earth's sunlight, which typically happens twice a year. So you typically get two eclipses a year of each type. Now, if you have the moon lining up between the sun, two weeks later it'll be on the far side, and it's likely to line up. So you almost always get a lunar eclipse and then two weeks later a solar, or a solar eclipse and two weeks later a lunar. Because if it's close enough on one side, two weeks later the Earth moved a wee bit, it's often close enough again. So if you go to Mr. Eclipse, my favorite eclipse website, Right, mystereclipse.com. These are the eclipses of 2019 and 2020. Can you see the dates cycling through? So roughly two weeks, you get another of the other type. All right, so early January, partial solar. Pacific Ocean, we didn't see that. We had a total lunar. Yes, we would have seen it, except for the fact that it was cloudy. Total solar in the summer. Down you go to Chile and you'll be all right. Two weeks later, Lunar. 
you've another solar coming up in December, and two weeks later, you've a lunar. Here we have our run of three. So you can have a lunar followed by a solar followed by another lunar. Okay? And then down at the end of the year, we've got lunar and then solar. So you get this pattern that if one is good, two weeks later, the next one's good. Two weeks later after that, you won't get it because the Earth will have moved a wee bit round and now the tilt means that the Moon is not going to be passing over the ecliptic, it's not going to be lining up exactly, okay? For students, this I think is the hardest thing you can possibly ask about eclipses, is why you don't get one every month, all right? If they're happy with the idea that you've got shadows being cast across space, you've got most of it there. The idea that the position of the moon varies above and below the ecliptic is the tricky bit. All right? So I can see that being a quite easy way to distinguish between those who sort of have it and those who've really got a very good model. Okay? But again, I think this is one of the more easily accessible parts of it. Because you've got the shadows and they are direct absorbable. Now, if you want to get into how often they occur, all right, this is his thousand-year canon of solar eclipses, you can predict solar eclipses out into the future ad infinitum. Because what you get is roughly 18 years on, the Earth, Sun, Moon are in a similar situation in space, of where they are in their orbit and where everything else is, and then you would get similar types of eclipses on an 18-year cycle. That cycle was discovered BC, that they repeat on this 18-year cycle. So it is quite easy to predict eclipses and to know where on the planet they're going to be happening. Because an eclipse cycle, which happens over thousands of years, is made up of repeating eclipses with 18 years between ones of the similar cycle. Now, you'll have about 40 eclipses in that 18-year period. So you've got multiple cycles all happening at the same time. Okay? And it just works out that the multiple ways of measuring the orbit of the moon, over 18 years and 11 days, they repeat and they match up. Okay? The maths of it is lovely and complicated. If you've got somebody who's dead into that, chuck them into the maths. They will swim or sink, but they will have a great time enjoying the mathematics and the repeating cycles that come round and round and round. Okay? So, there's our eclipses. Also with observable, we can get this idea. So this image from, is from the Galileo spacecraft, which started on the Earth and headed off to Jupiter. This picture was taken as it was heading out to Jupiter back in 1992. So from space, the Earth also shows phases. So if you're out in space, have a look. There we have daytime side of the Earth, the daytime side of the Moon. This has been color enhanced. The Moon has been brought up in brightness. The Moon is not a particularly bright object. All right. we, we see it quite bright in the sky. It's not particularly far away. Uh, reflects a reasonable amount of light on it, but it is a reasonably dark, dull object. So this kind of image can be great for saying, okay, this is Earth and Moon from space. How big are they? What's their scale? What's their size? Because remember, people have looked and seen that kind of picture, where you've got a blob for the sun, a blob for the Earth, and a blob for the Moon. And the sun's biggest, Earth's in between and the Moon's smaller, and that's kind of what a lot of people get for the sizes. So we need to look a little bit at the sizes. Remember, there's your image of the lunar eclipse. Big, medium, small. We need to get a little bit more detail than big, medium, and small. So, big and small. And really big if we're going towards the Sun. So, this would be your decent comparison. Approximately, the Moon is about a quarter the size of the Earth, a third to a quarter, roughly. So if you remember diameters in your head, great. If you remember radiuses in your head, great. Otherwise, look them up. I run with a roughly 13,000 for 
the, the size of the Earth. It's a little bit less. Um, the, rad the radius is more like 6,000. I've got it here, actually. 6,378 for the Earth's radius and 1738 for the Moon. So if you get out your calculator, do your ratios, you've got it. Okay? By comparison, the Sun is nearly 700,000 kilometers. So if we're at 6,000 and a bit to 700,000, we're 100 times bigger. So here, if we go, this is roughly, what are we there? A little more than a meter? We need 100 meters for the Sun. Our tower is not 100 meters tall. I think out to our front courtyard is about 60 meters. So on this same scale, if we have the sun, it's ridiculous. Okay? We have an enormous sun. Um, I do one activity, give a circle of string that you've pre-cut, pull it out into a circle. I make mine about a meter across, so it fits nicely on a table. Hand up some pieces of paper and say, how big is the earth on the same scale? Let, let bits of paper be popped out. Ask for confidence. 100% confident on that? Kind of right? Not sure? That's definitely wrong? Have the discussion on your confidence. And if you've got your one meter sun, your earth is a centimeter. And it's a nice, very graphic way to bring home the relative scales. So sun to earth, 109, roughly 100 to 1. And then down to the moon, a quarter. So you've got your sizes. Because you're significantly smaller in mass, it's less of you, the gravitational pull is less, one-sixth. Now, to scale, this picture was taken one, from one of the Mars explorers. There's your Earth. Can you just about make out your moon? The little titch? That's getting the distance between them. <coughs> this is not what you see in the textbooks because you can't see it clearly by the time you shrink it down to fit in the bottom of the page, all right? So this one, if you've got the Earth being a basketball, roughly how big is the moon? Yeah, it's a quarter the size. So, yeah? How far apart? What do you like? What do you reckon? Right, but there's a picture ish. Width of the room? City center. Put the road. It's it's a thing, isn't it? It's really hard to visualize. All right? So, the moon, I'm agreeing with you, yeah, they suggest tennis ball. That's a small tennis ball. All right? Um, nice thing to do is that's roughly head-sized. Yeah? So if your head is the size of the moon, your fist. But then everybody goes, oh, well, there it is because it's obviously attached to your arm, all right? So you have it, oh, there it is, and then you go, oh, yeah, I can see phases, oh, yeah, there's I'm moving things around, I've got, oh, that's new moon, and that's full moon, and they're grand and happy. But you've got to get the distance right. So one that works is the distance between the Earth and the moon is about 400,000 kilometers, rounding a little bit. So if this is 13,000, across. We have to go out to 400,000. We're going out about 30 times. All right? We can get 30 times if we wrap the string around this 10 times, because pi is about 3. So 1, Six, seven, eight, nine, nine, ten. So that's about ten. We'll pop a pen.
pegging it there so we don't lose our 10. Wrap that around. But that's about where we have 10. If you wouldn't mind, could you head away until our string comes out? There we go. So roughly from the center of the planet. Did that work for us? Very graphic way to do it. If you're doing this with somebody's head, wrap it round their head. <laughs> I have not been accused of child cruelty yet. I do ask permission to wrap it round their head. And we wrap around ten times round the head and then pull it out and it's the length of the room. And it's a nice size to do because it fits in a room. Alright, so a basketball or any object, choose a quarter times smaller and go around it roughly ten times and you've got a scale for it. That distance at 400,000 kilometers, the sun is 700,000 kilometers in radius. So you've got to go double that and you still are inside the sun. So on that scale, your sun is going to be the full orbit doubled. And that really brings home, and that's just the size of the sun, that brings home how much bigger the sun is than anything else in the solar system, which is part of the scales and understanding how everything's related. Okay? So our sun here, we've got to come back out the far side and then double it. It's crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. So the end of this says, yeah, about seven meters. And that's pretty much what we were. So it's nice when it works out between what you're told and what you actually get with the string. So for that you just need a person and all the string. And the magic number ten times around their head. Okay? So we've got our Earth to Moon to scale and so we have one much, much bigger than the other. Um, these kind of moons on a stick they're very easy for showing faces, okay? With the proviso that, of course, they're holding it out of arm's length and it should be the length of the moon. These are very nice for demonstrating eclipses. So if you want to show an eclipse, you stand so that the light does not go onto your face. If you get a shadow on your face, you can see there's an eclipse, so can everybody else. On a sunny day, go outside and do it outside. Hold up the moon to appear with the sun illuminating it. And if you do it at third quarter phase of the moon in the morning sky, you can hold it in exactly the right position to reproduce what you see in the sky. All right, so go outside with these on a sunny day. If you go out at third quarter phase, you've got the little half a moon in the morning sky. And you can zip out and see. I have the ability to make it cloudy by doing that. Hopefully you have better luck than I do. Okay, but it's very easy to head these outside. Now, when we talk about the moon, this is the side we see. This side um, is where, until this year, all the people that went and landed went to. Uh, in January this year, uh, the Chinese went around the back of the moon. But prior to that, this is where they went. All right. uh, the Apollo missions, that's the American with humans. Lunacod is Russian, and that was a rover that was remote controlled. And there was Lunacod 1 and Lunacod 2. They drove around quite successfully, even though the Russians never successfully sent humans. But their rovers did a fabulous job of driving around the moon. The various surveyors were the early missions to figure out everything they needed to do before sending humans. And Luna is another series of the Russian missions. 
they've kept the numbering and there's intention to do the rest of the lunars in the next decade. So the rest of the little higher lunar 20s will be going because they're making a connection to their past history. So, I mean, that's showing where, the, where people went. This is kind of what we see. This appearance is a little bit easier to make sense of. It. We see this side of the moon. As the moon is spinning on its own axis, it spins around every 27.3 days. That is compared to the stars. Okay? So um, there are a couple of, of language terms that come in here that can throw up a few bits of money. Okay? Um, the sidereal time period is compared to the sidereal reference, which is the stars. So distant, faraway stars all surrounding us in space. If we mark Compared to that star, we spin around once compared to that star. At the same time, we're going around the sun. Carrying the moon with it moves around the sun. So the moon has to do an extra couple of days to get back to the same phase. And that averages to be 29 and a half days. Occasionally it's less, occasionally it's more, because sometimes the Earth is going a little bit faster, so is the Moon, because of where it is in its orbit. The orbit is elliptical, so you don't have the same gravitational forces the same way. So you have a speedy bit of the Moon in Earth, and you have a slightly slower Earth Moon. So 29 and a half days average between any phase to the next phase. But 27.3 compared to the stars. I would say that the Moon goes around the Earth once a month, roughly. And don't panic about the precise days, okay? It would be a brutal question to be picky about 27.3 and 29 and a half, given that they are different types of rotation, sidereal against the stars versus the um, synodic going around to the same phase of the moon. As we're going around, we're tilted, okay? So the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees, the moon is tilted about one and a half degrees. So with that slight tilt of the moon, we do sometimes see a little extra at the north or a little extra at the south. Just because it's very slightly tilted itself, it's not enough to give seasons, all right? It's not enough to have the north pole or the south pole fully in sunlight, which of course our planet experiences, but you do have that little extra tilt there. As it's spinning, it is also orbiting exactly 27.3 days. Because it's in elliptical orbit, a little bit further, a little bit closer, you have this variation in size. So these are two full <coughs> moons taken different months when the full moon was when the moon at its closest versus the full moon at its furthest. About five or six years ago, um, I started noticing many more mentions to a supermoon. Do you remember supermoons 10 years ago? No. That seems about four or five years ago. There were supermoons. I'd never heard of a supermoon before that. That's a supermoon. Okay, it's a little bit closer. So it'll look a little bit brighter. That's it, you know? That's, yeah. And if it's a little bit closer one month, the next month it'll probably be a little bit closer as well. Because the elliptical orbit, again, is fixed with respect to the stars. So you've got about two, three months as the moon is going around that it'll be in that kind of, the full moon will be near that slightly closer part. And then, Six months later, the new moon will be in that slightly closer. But we don't go crazy for a super new moon, because you can't see it. So you get super moons, yeah. And normally you get about three in a row when it's just that little bit bigger. No big deal. And we only call them a super moon if it's that full moon. Go figure. I, somebody got onto the marketing. I don't know if supermoon.com is a website, but somebody's got onto it, and I can't figure out why it's such an excitement. But sure enough, it is. So notice that both cases, these are quite different months 
it's still the same side. And it is always the same side. So we see the near side, okay? You do hear mention of the dark side of the moon. Both sides get illuminated by the sun. The side we see and the side that we don't see. They both do get sunlight on them. So the dark side doesn't work. It goes round in 27 three days, it goes round us in 27.3, so it spins exactly once with one orbit, so we always see the same side. Um, with students, I get them to do this. I get them to chug around walking with one person saying what to do and one person doing it and the rest of the class commenting. Are they going around? Are they seeing one side? Are they only ever seeing the ear of that person? Is that person spinning around? And you get the person who's being the moon who's spinning around to say, I'm looking that way, and now I'm looking that way, and now I'm looking that way, and now I'm looking that way. Oh yeah, I have looked at everybody in the room. I must be turning. But you have to do it, and you have to see it, okay? As we go around, we always see the near side. That's the near side. The other side of the moon does get sunlight on it. It's the far side, rather than the dark side. And that little YouTube video is a beautiful little explanation from Minute Earth about the phase of the moon. So if you've seen Minute Science, Minute Physics, there's a Minute Earth which is mostly Earth science topics, but there's a lovely phases of the moon that you can see there. So we're going around, that's the other side. If I put that up first, would you have known that's the moon? It does not look the same, does it? Like, we'd know if we saw that, because that's what we see. And we always see that. So we've got a big bright crater down here, Tycho. We've got the soccer player. We've got these lovely flat areas. All right, that's what we see. Look at the other side. It is significantly different. All right. And we will look at why, why it's so different. Now, when we went to the moon, of course we took pictures of the Earth. This is from 1966. All right, so one of the unmanned missions to check, we're going to go put a human on the moon by the end of this decade and do everything because it's hard and I'm sorry I can't do a JFK accent, okay? I can't do the Boston chewing the words, okay? But when JFK said, we're going to go to the moon, the Americans had put one person into a 15-minute orbit. That is all they had done. One person for 15 minutes. And he said, lads, we're going to go. We're going to do. So they did incremental steps and took these images. There's, obviously, there's our home. That's us. There's the moon. Very crackly picture here. This is from Lunar Orbiter 1. All right, 1966. The later one is the one that everybody went crazy for. So this was from, this was actually from Apollo 11. Um, the very famous Earthrise, it was voted one of the best pictures ever, was from the earlier mission, okay, the one that had gone uh, a couple of months earlier. But any of these really strikingly pull out the differences between the Earth and the Moon. So barren, rocky, heavily cratered, no, no visible atmosphere, versus blue and clouds and gorgeous, and isn't it fabulous? So remarkable differences between them. You don't catch the size and the distance here, but we're looking at four, approximately 400,000 kilometers away. It's gorgeous. I, I'm, I love it. I love it. The reason we get so interested in discovering about the moon and looking at the moon is because we believe the early moon, when it formed, came from the Earth. So we've got some ideas about how the moon formed. 
And the processes that have changed the Earth haven't been happening on the Moon. So if we want to know about the early Earth, we look at the Moon. So the composition of the rocks on the Moon tell us about the early Earth. But the arrangement and what's happened to the Moon is obvious on the Moon. The scarring, the impacts, everything can be seen on the Moon. So the Moon tells us about ourselves. So this little summary is pretty straightforward, okay? That's our sizes, that's our tilt. So the seven degrees, we've got the one and a half plus the five, okay? So compared to our line, okay? Temperatures, we've got a nice atmosphere, so we keep our temperatures pretty steady. Minus 73 to 48, it's not bad. Compared to the moon, minus to plus. Okay, minus of seven, oh yeah, because we do get extremely hot on the sunny side. I've added a minus where I shouldn't have, sorry about that. Thick atmosphere with a bit of greenhouse effect, lots of liquid water, maybe some water on the moon. Ice in the poles. We've got that far side looking so radically different. So to explain why the far side of the moon looks so different, we need to know a little bit of the points about the moon. So. The moon's density is quite low. Compared to the terrestrial planets, the moon is lighter. There's less iron. Now, the surface of the, of the Earth doesn't have a whole lot of iron, but the core is iron. So there's less iron. That ha might help explain why it's lower density. There's less iron. There's more aluminium, there's more titanium. And the moon is like the Earth's mantle. So once you go a little bit below the crust of the, of the Earth, those rocks, that's what the moon is like. So if we need to explain that there's lower density, different chemical compositions, but it's similar to the mantle, then we have to look at how we think it's formed. So your main early ideas are the top three. First one's granite, but if it formed at the same time, where's the iron? If they're formed at the same time from the same stuff, they should be the same chemicals. And it doesn't have any iron, so that doesn't work. Second one, well, it's formed somewhere else. No, the chemicals are too similar. All right? They're a little different if you go somewhere else around the solar system. Okay? They have the same composition as rocks from here. Okay? It's too similar to say it's came from somewhere else. Third one is, okay, so it's a bit of the Earth, because it's quite similar but not entirely. So if you had a really fast spinning early Earth, <laughs> out you get with the moon. Problem is, how fast you have to spin to do that actually doesn't work. Okay, but those were the early ideas that we had to explain the different compositions. So the better one, okay, early solar system, let's just mash something about half the size of the Earth, i.e. the size of Mars, into the baby Earth, very early in the formation of the solar system, everything's a little bit melty, but started to cool, because if you've partially cooled your Earth, there's your iron, and that's not going to get whacked all over the place. And you've got the material of the mantle whacked into and flung out into space. And that's the generally accepted theory now for where the moon came from. Baby Earth gets whacked by the equivalent planet of Mars. Which, given the formation of the solar system, that's entirely likely. Chunks of rock moving through the initial stellar nebula. Most of it is performing the sun, but you've got cooler, further out sections where you can have this happening. So, in picture form, whack it and whack it out. Once you've got that, you can explain why you get such a difference. If you start with a hot baby Earth and a cooling moon orbiting that hot Earth, differences between the two sides are linked to the thickness of the crust. So we have a much thicker crust on the far side of the moon. Okay, The moon's surface is physically thicker. The chemicals that have made it up have come up from the moon cooling. The side that was nearer the Earth, which would have been tidally locked almost immediately, all right, um, 
I read one paper that reckoned it could have happened within four or five months. I read another paper that said it probably took about 100 years. But in the billion year history of the solar system, it almost immediately tidally locked. Any variation in the orbit, any, any egg shaping that was happening to the moon, the tug of the Earth would have pulled it into its orbit. If it was trying to spin faster, it would have been pulled back. If it was trying to spin slower, it would have been pulled forward, and it would have locked itself into the same side facing us. Okay? And if you've got a hot Earth, that is going to keep the side facing us from cooling down. So the rocks are forming faster and better on the cooler outer side and staying more molten on the warmer inner side. So your crust ends up thinner and your crust is thicker. So a little bit later in solar system history, when you start whacking rocks around the period of, of bombardment, the thinner rock cracks and you get this lava basalt flowing out of the molten moon. So you have this dark basalt on the side facing us because the thinner crust cracked and allowed the lava out. On the outer side, only in a few places, and there's one down here, which is where the Chinese had landed, only in a few places do you have these big ones where a really big impact was able to crack through. There's currently no volcanism on the moon. It's cooled down enough that the molten core has, has solidified. But there was in the past. So you have these smoother basalt regions, different type of rock, with these highlands which were older and formed first. And then, of course, you bombard it regularly, and you get these nice new young craters. And they're found all over the moon. But they're not the big, huge bollock wallops that hit it at the beginning. All right, so this far side problem, only discovered when we went around the far side and took photos, was resolved fairly easily by, let's think about how we could possibly form it. But we didn't know it was a problem until we sent someone around there to take a photo. All right, and those early missions mean first human in space is 1961. This only became a problem in the 60s when we'd actually gone around and had a look and gone, oh boy, where'd that come from then? All right, so we have a very, very different appearance there. Now, we've talked about the moon. What's wrong with those? Okay, too big, yeah, Christmas card. There we go. Does the moon have that appearance? Do you get little skinny crescents? Yes. Yeah. Do you get little skinny crescents facing that way in the evening? No. Yeah, that's the morning crescent moon. Okay? So when we see our moon, it's lit by the sunlight. The side that's lit is the side facing the sun. So if that's facing the sun, the sun's just about to come up. But that picture looks like Santa's coming in the evening. This one, there's our little crescent moon. But they're all lit up and doing their evening things. I'd chuck that to somebody and ask them to explain it. Because if they've got that, they've got it. All right? They've understood the idea that the appearance of the moon is quite predictable and there are certain times when you will see it, okay? So I've moved from our formation into some of the representations of the moon, where we see the moon and how it affects us in our everyday life. I have another cultural connection for you. When is Easter? I've got the dates out there. So Easter this year, the first column is Western versus Eastern Christianity. We use a slightly different calendar to work it out. Ours is based on the Gregorian calendar, so we changed. Theirs is based on the Julian, it's 11 days out, and that affects when they start counting for Easter. So we have different dates on the two different Christian churches. This is when Easter might be for us. So 
Earliest Easter is March 22nd. Latest Easter is April 25th. Here's a few thousand Easter's. This is when they're most likely to occur. They're all over the place, aren't they? All right. I tend to ask this and say, when's Easter? And they go, mm. I said, okay, when's Christmas? They go, December 25th. When's Easter? Um, uh, uh -huh. Okay. So Easter was originally based on Passover. Okay. So if we're recognizing Christ crucified, that was at Passover. So the early Christians used to just go ask their neighbors, when's Passover? And they celebrate Easter at the end of that week. So you would put the problem onto the Jewish community because the Jewish community is celebrating Passover. Okay. The Jewish calendar is lunar. So each month is a loon, a month, a month. There are not 12 full moons in a year. We're 11 days short. So the Jewish calendar moves the start of each month. If you start at the 1st of January, one month, by the time you go through 12 lunar months, you're in our mid-December, and you start your next month before the year is out. So to keep it tied into the years, every two or three years, a month is added. So the Jewish calendar is 12 months in a year, except when it's 13. No problem, right? And that keeps you roughly tied in close enough because your month is going to be 29 and a half days, so 29 days or 30 days, and you've got 11 to count every two years of 22, every third year that's 33, so every two or three years if you stick an extra month in, you'll come out with your months lining up with your years. So no problem, right? So early Christians just said to the neighbors, so when should we have Easter? Then there was a little bit of a discussion about maybe that wasn't quite a satisfactory way to sort it out. Um, so Council of Nicaea said, okay, we'll make it after the spring equinox so that Easter doesn't happen before spring. So the spring equinox is March 20th or 21st. They said, let's call it March 21st. It can be the 20th. But it, they said, let's make it March 21st. And then we need to make it the Sunday after the full moon, because we'll reflect the original Passover, which is based on the moon. So we have the full moon, and then we have the Sunday after. This is why we don't know when Easter is. <laughs> because the full moon, being lunar, doesn't occur on the same day of the month, every month because our months got some extra days in them to get them to fit into a year. So originally months were 29, 30, if we go back to the Roman calendar, and but then they stuck in extra five or six days here and an extra five or six days there, depending on their mood, pretty much. If you look at the Roman calendar, depending on who the consul was and who was in charge, and then later the emperor, if they wanted to, they could stick in extra days, but if they didn't have to, and the result was that nobody in the Roman Empire actually knew which month it was, because it depended how they added the extra days in or not, and it wasn't written out. So Julius, Julius Caesar, went and sorted it out. He ended up with a month named after him, now July, and he straightened it out a little bit, okay, and said we're going to make these more regular months with these more regular days, but it doesn't fit the moon anymore. So we end up with this very complicated series that we have. If there's a full moon on the 1st of January one year, the next year you will not have a full moon on the 1st of January because the full moon would have happened 11 days earlier. Although roughly every 18 years it repeats-ish, plus or minus 11 days, which gives you your eclipse cycles if you can work out. So when is Easter as a nice little chewy, hmm, can I make sense of this pattern that happens? And it, you know, you can see that occasionally, early, late, early, like we're kind of late this year. But if you think last year, April 1st, 
year before April 16th, year before March, that's very early, March 27th, anything in March is pretty early. And April, we can be later, we can be as late as April 25th. So we can kind of see that we can float around middle April with the odd late and the odd early. The very odd early, the very odd late. And they're less common. Because it's just also when we have it on a Sunday. So there's a nice connection there about celebrating festivals. Obviously, if you're Jewish, your festivals are based on the moon. So Passover will be happening based on the moon. Uh, if you follow, if you're following Islam, then um, festivals start with the crescent moon. So Ramadan starts with a little crescent moon. And that will move throughout the year as the years go on. So it moves a little bit earlier every year. But it always starts with a little skinny little crescent moon. Now, here's another cultural connection. I'm afraid I haven't hooked up the sound. Or we could celebrate Fly Me to the Moon, which was played to the Apollo 10 crew. Cloud of Loom, Moonlight Sonata, or Bad Moon Rising. I think we've got something for most musical tastes here. And if you want to go a little bit more modern, there's a selection of colorful moon songs. All right, so you've got a nice good selection of your songs there. And this is a nice direction to go as well, is go, how does the moon appear in common culture? So, I apologize for some of the graphics here. They're a little bit hard to see, but we're starting with 1959, Landers and impactors. So lander means you survive it, impactor means you don't, okay? So landers, you land and you can get out. Impactors, you crash and see what you've got. Orbiters and the test missions. Anything that might have been a near-Earth orbit or a readiness or a flight test. So 59 going across there to 1972. So as you can see, the 60s were pretty busy. All right, there's a mixture of both Russian and American here, but not anybody else's. We've got the Lunacod, we've got our little rover there from 1970, a whole series of Russian landers, a whole series of American landers, and of course the American ones that carry humans. So we've got our Apollo 11 and 12 here. Apollo 13 had the problem. We've got 14, 15, 16, 17. That brings us to 1972, and that's the last humans on the moon. There's 73 to 2003. We'll just skip the 80s. It's remarkable, isn't it? How many missions and how much activity we had there versus to 2003. We do have a little bit more involvement. We still have the Russians. Smart One is a European mission just popping in there in 2003. 2007 up to now, I had to update the graphic I found. I've got a few cancelled orbits, cancelled missions in there. But now we have missions that are operating for long duration. Not just let's go to the moon and stomp around for a day or a week, but let's put an orbiter that got there in 2010 and is still working. So that's the American Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and that's where a lot of the images in this presentation have come from, from their work, because they're still working and still orbiting and still looking. All right? We have uh, Japanese missions, we have Chinese missions, we have Indian missions. We have a few whose dates have been pushed out. So for 2018, 2019, a few of them have been pushed into 2020, from 2018 to 2019, from 2019 to 2020. But the future is there as well. So the Russians are intending to return. Luna 27, Luna 28, Luna 29 have been planned out. 26 to orbit. This is Celine, this is Japanese, being cancelled, all right? We've got plans from the Americans with the Space Launch System to be going certainly in the lunar area in the next little bit. 
So there are plans to continue the lunar exploration, even though the heyday of it was the 60s. And of course, when we're there in the 60s, this is your roll call. Who stomped around on the moon? All American, all men. Four of them still alive. But if you look at the dates, all right, Buzz Aldrin's doing well, but he was born in 1930. And he's not in the best of health now. We have a two who were born 1935. That's a year older than my dad. So they're 84. These are old men. You know? And if you look at who's recently died, Alan Bean, Edgar Mitchell, Gene Cernan in 2017, John Young, 2018. So we're losing them quite rapidly. So it really is, we were very so disappointed when Buzz Aldrin wasn't able to come to Cork two years ago in the summer. He was supposed to come, he, I think he'd been to the Antarctic and had got ill and was advised not to travel. His son came, another Dr. Aldrin, and came and talked and spoke to us and conveyed his wishes from his father. So we're very disappointed because of course Buzz is the one in the famous pictures. All right, you can see the reflection in his faceplate but Buzz is the one that we have the pictures taken. Now, to go to the moon, interesting side light, literally side, on the side. This is how they trained. One sixth gravity. How are you going to have your full strength operating in one sixth gravity? Slight angle, and they harness them up. So they walk sideways. And the effort that took was one sixth. So they still use their full muscles but at 1 6 gravity. Because there's no point just bouncing them around and pretending they went and, you know, they explored the craters that are in existence on the Earth to have the sense of what the crater environment of the moon would be like. They practiced the docking and undocking repeatedly, suspended and strung up with the thrusters because it's a totally different control system than airplanes. And a lot of these first Apollo astronauts were pilots. And they didn't think that the pilot, the pilot would help, but not if your reflexes are taking you the wrong way. So they practice and practice and practice the maneuvers, and they practice walking around sideways. The result is they successfully not only landed and walked around, but drove around. Lunar buggies for three of the missions. But the last men on the moon is 1972. First man is 69, 22nd July 69, the last man is December 1972. And that's it's phenomenal that that was just such a tiny period. So what are we doing now? Well, the Chinese are on the moon right now. Landed January of this year, okay? Far side of the moon. So to be able to talk to the Earth. They had initially sent a satellite to go park itself out beyond the moon. So they're talking to the relay satellite, the relay satellite's talking to us. So pretty straightforward, just send it line of sight. It's hard to communicate through the moon. Okay? Uh, this is um, a lunar reconnaissance orbiter image of where they've landed. All right? So there's the little tiny in the center, that's where they landed. It's, it's phenomenal, all right? Um, there's not a huge amount of information that's easy to access about Changi, about where it, where it is and what it's doing, okay? But the Americans are taking plenty of pictures. <laughs> and I just think that's just such an interesting reflection of, yeah, we're up on the moon, we can see what you're doing. We're taking pictures and we're publishing our pictures. So uh, they're in a crater that's 180 kilometers across. They've got plenty of chance to explore and have a look. And how about this one? This is the one that's on its way right now. Now, this, this is um, a leftover from the Google Lunar X Prize. So the Google company had a huge prize running of can you get to the moon? You need to be privately funded. So it was tricky enough to do. Uh, the Israeli team, with what they have announced as Beersheet, has headed off 
to the moon. They launched the end of February. So, ever increasingly larger orbits around the Earth until you end up ever decreasing orbits around the Moon and then you land. That's next month. All things going well next week. They should be changing their orbit sufficient to scoop them out. That's the picture that they took. So there they are. A small country, big dreams is what it says. And there's the earth behind. So that picture was released um, last week, 3rd of March. Privately funded college students, mostly, built a small lander. They did well enough with the lunar, Google Lunar X Prize that they won a couple of the prizes, and that was, you know, a million here, a million there. Enough to get them onto one of the American rockets and get them launched. Follow it on Twitter. I mean, we're going to the moon now. This is so cool. What will we do in the future? Well, it's been announced that the intention is for Gateway Moon. So that's going to be a space station around the moon with a view that, that we can then go to the moon and go to Mars. So the Americans, these are the American images from NASA, uh, but the European Space Agency is involved, the Canadian Space Agency is involved. It will be another of those international projects. So if you're going to head to the moon, you need the honking big American spacecraft. Okay, so this is the space launch system. This is a big, heavy, powerful rocket to get you into space. This is not designed to go to the space station. So the plan is that this will go to a new station next to the moon. Once you've got a new station next to the moon, you can go to the moon or head to Mars. Because that's the tension. What do you do? Do you head straight for Mars? Or do you go to the moon first? And I think they've gone with a kind of in-between. Like, we know how to build space stations. They're not too hard to build. We don't have to worry about going up and down to the moon to make a lunar base. So we'll make an orbiting station. And from there, we can do more on the moon and then work towards Mars in the future. This is all very recent. The Canadian Space Agency only announced their involvement in it last week. So what this will be and how it will develop and how everybody's coming on board with it is still happening. But the European Space Agency is very excited about it, although they are intending to work with the Russians, okay, with a planned launch in 2024 to go to the moon and get samples. The Europeans have also made some of the parts for the heavy, heavy lifter, the SLS system. So Europe is working within both organizations and getting into partnership so we can go to space with this. Of course, if we go to the moon, where are we going to live? I mean, that's the moon. But do you remember there were volcanoes in the past? Those volcano lava tubes. And occasionally they break the surface. So there's some intention to go live in lava tubes underneath the surface of the moon. I'm not making it up. That could be someone's hope. <laughs> All right, because there's lava tubes. So you get in the odd crater, lava tubes popped, down you go. Cozy. Now, to bring this to your students, ESA have, in the last about, about two months, really upped their game with the resources they have available. So they've got a lot more attention um, about the moon as a topic, and have really stretched into other areas and given it a lunar twist. So they call it Teach with Space. This is just two of them. There are plenty out there. 
Um, they come with some nice activities, very approachable, aimed for sort of a 12 to 15 year old crowd, with background information, with extra bits, beautifully presented, sort of 10, 20 page PDFs that you can download. The power with from water is, okay, we're gonna to go to the moon, what's on the moon, what's there on the moon, how do we get something from it? And then you're doing electrolysis. So you're doing the things that you might already be doing, but you're giving it a lunar twist. It's not gonna teach you that much about the moon, but it's gonna give a nice space hook on which you can hang the other things about the moon. I mean, the design and build and lander is looking at forces, speed, impacts, measurements. But also saying, you can't have a parachute because there's no atmosphere on the moon to slow you down. So making some connections with what we do, okay? So I highly recommend that. For a while, ESA was kind of, hadn't got everything as perfect and they really have done a great job in these resources. And I'm gonna leave you with their recent 10 things you did not know about the moon. And this is to support the forward to the moon. Let's go to the moon and let's join Gateway Moon. So 50 spacecraft have launched from the Earth to fly past orbit, impact, or land. I mean, we've done a good job of getting there. You can get there in eight hours. You just can't stop. <laughs> I'm often asked, how long does it take to get to the moon? I'm like, do you want to slow down and stop? Typically, three days. A follow mission, three days. That gets you there. Reasonable for humans. But if you're not in a rush, smart, the first European one took a year with an ion drive. Mosey through space. Easy. If you want to talk to people on the moon, about a second. 400,000, 300,000 kilometers a second, yeah. So a little over a second to talk to anybody on the moon. It's moving away from us. And it also used to be closer, okay? And that goes to being how it was created and what that tells us about ourselves. All the people who walked around on the moon were almost allergic to it. Reported systems like Symptoms like hay fever. So just nasty stuff. There's water. We know that primarily from an American mission that smashed a spacecraft into it, deliberately, and looked at what came out. So if we're gonna explore, we'll have water. And the moon has a very thin little atmosphere. When it's cold, it settles down, but when it's on the sunny side, it warms up. So extremely thin, but we have to account for that in our trips to the moon. And the last of the 10 things you didn't know, we've got material there we can use, and we still see impacts on the moon now. So there's a series of um, lunar observations, particularly useful during eclipses when you've got the full moon and it's not brightly lit. Um, because otherwise you need to have the darker bit of the moon and so when it's mostly dark, that is your skinny little crescent moon, and that's over near the sun, and that's hard to see. Okay, so we go looking for the brilliant flashes of light to see the result of impacts. So I think even those 10 images themselves are nice. Here's a thing, make one like it. You know? Not, they're, they're reasonable infographics, they're not over heavy, they don't have too much. And if you want the full support of you know, a video to show you all the bits. The Night Sky Network, I cannot recommend highly enough. Extremely good Night Sky Network. All right, this is Does the Moon Rotate? The idea is about the phases and the appearance and the moving. It comes with a description, activity, a video of someone doing it, a suggested script, a response from your audience. It's designed for informal groups, astronomy groups, completely adaptable to a formal learning environment. And the Night Sky Network is the Astronomy Society of the Pacific with support of Jet Propulsion Lab out in California. Extremely well developed, well tested, fun to use with the very helpful script and the background information. Okay? 
I'll finish there. We've gone a little over past time. Thank you for staying.